So you want to put an AOD in your classic Mustang or Ford and you don't quite know what all you're going to need. Well, after we get through with you today, you definitely will. So transmission probably will be first on the list of things that you would need to have in order yep. to do this, this swap. Yep. If you can nowadays, 470W is the way to go if you can stand to do the electronics for the controllers. Yes. Um, if you want a mechanical, AOD is your way. Yeah, but even with that, you're still having to go in and do things. You got to put a TV cable on. You yep. got to worry about whether your line pressures are correct. If your line pressures aren't correct on the AOD, you're going to you screw the AOD them. up <laughs> and you have to buy another transmission. Yep. So I look at that as like, the electronics kind of take away part of that. As long as you have a TPS yeah. sensor, which yeah. we like the one we installed on the Fairlane, it takes That's away. something that you got to have too. If you got a carburetor set up, you got to have TPS. the TPS sensor and they they make them for, you know, Edelbrock carburetors, yeah. for Holley carburetors, so you can get a TPS sensor. But again, something you're going to need to go in with all this yeah. stuff. And that's kind of what we're talking about. So we got the transmission talked about. We're going to do that. Got should have a torque converter with it. Most of the time when you buy them, you're going to get a torque converter because you're going to want to set that up for whatever chassis you're working on. Let's say you're doing a 69 Fairlane, you're probably going to want a little bit different torque converter with a 351 Windsor or a 289 302 than you would want with a 351 Cleveland because of some of the differences in the way those engines operate. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all. The stall speed's all set up based on your engine, where it's making power, uh, the weight of the vehicle affects stall speed a bit as well but it's mostly determined by your engine. Yeah, the cam is the big factor in that. If you're running a big, heavy, hot cam on it, you're going to want a little more stall speed yeah. than you would if you're running a lightweight cam that's yeah. not got a lot of push to it. Which so lets it push up through the RPM range to get to where the cam actually exactly. moves, right? So we got those taken care of. Then we're going to talk a little bit about, well, you're going to need a flex plate because the AOD yep. 4R70W runs a 164 tooth flex plate. Yep. And you need the right imbalance for your engine. Which 28 depend, in the, <laughs> depend, that's depending true. on what year you have that's engine, true. like this Frankenstein, we don't know what <laughs> imbalance. We're pretty engine. sure this is a this is a 75 motor, mm -hmm. so it's still going to be a 28 ounce imbalance. Okay. Anything after I think 1981 ish, and it is really an ish, you're looking at probably a uh, 50 ounce imbalance. But do check that before you start going out and buying flex plates. <laughs> you're going to need a flex plate probably either way, but if you buy the in our transmission out of a say an explorer with the five liter in it yeah that would be a different setup than what you need and it might be a good idea if you can get the whole thing to do the whole thing to yeah. get the the you know the aod 4r 70w and the, the 5.0 out of the explorer mm -hmm. as a unit so you've got the flex plate you've got the engine plate uh, which goes in between the transmission and the engine uh, that's going to be something you're going to need to have. And you have to be careful on that, too, because mm -hmm. there's a couple of different versions <laughs> of that 4R70W cross-plate. Uh, cross um, intermediate plate. Intermediate plate. Because yeah. uh, the one that we like is the one that we have on the 69 Fairlane Wagon. It's a big open inspection cover. Love the big inspection cover. Makes things a lot easier yeah. when you're doing your final installs. Speaking of that, you're going to need the, uh, the nuts for the torque, torque converter. Torque converter nuts, uh, possibly longer bell housing bolts. Yes. If you go 4R70W, I believe the flange is thicker than the AOD flange is. But regardless... Actually, I think those two flanges are the same. I know they're different than the C4. Okay. I well, think the C4 flange is shorter and the bolts won't work. You have to go to the next side, next length up bolt in yeah. order to get everything to pop together. Because at least that's what we ran into on the wagon. Fairland, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, transmission cross member. Yes, cross member. Need a new cross member to move it further back. A uh, new rubber mount would be a good idea at the same time. Yes. Uh, also, trans cooler. Um, personally, I like external coolers more than the internal one. Now, why do you want to do... Well, I was kind of curious about that because we didn't do that on the wagon. Mm -hmm. But we had the radiator. We cleaned it all out so that we could run the stock yeah. cooling system on it. Because that's not a car that sees a lot of high-performance driving. It's just a, a tool-around car that we use going place to place. Yeah. So, I like external coolers better because fluid to air is more efficient for cooling uh, and also if you're using the coolant the most you're going to really cool it down to is about 180 degrees right which is still pretty hot for transmission okay. um, so i just like to move it to an external and then you don't have to worry about having to back flush you might run some trash into your new brand new transmission and the original coolers really didn't have much flow characteristics to them like you weren't doing a whole lot of cooling through those Right, right. So now that makes me think, why did we do what we did <coughs> with, with the wagon? <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about putting an external 
ancillary cooler on it mm -hmm. that was thermostatically controlled. Yeah, uh, you can do that. And um, that's something that we may still do on the wagon, but I mean, it seems to do just fine the way it is. For us on the wagon, we're not really pushing that hard. Mm -hmm. We're not building a lot of transmission temperature because we don't really dog it that much. No. Uh, that. It's most, eh, kind of, but <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a cruiser for 85% of its life. <laughs> <laughs> Transmission lines, now the thing that a lot of people don't realize is even between the AOD and the 4R70W, there is a size difference yep. in the transmission lines. Yeah, I think the 4R went to a bigger line. Size. I think it's like a 3 8 yeah. line. I think, I think technically it's a metric line. Yeah. Because uh, the 4R70W is a metric transmission. And we went to the salvage yard, got the steel lines yep. out of an Explorer, and yep. modified those to work in the wagon. Yep. I think that's still a good option for the most M part. Majority on your lines. of chassis, you could cut up that line section and just make soft line. Yeah, spots. it actually, it really was weird how well it yeah, went into the <laughs> chassis on there because it, it went over the frame rail and everything, mm -hmm. or the cross member. Missed the engine mounts, everything. Yeah, and so it was kind of odd how that worked out. So a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that the Explorer 5.0, all of the things are very similar yeah, to the 302, general, 289, 351 Cleveland even. Yeah. Um, so you got transmission lines you're going to need. The only other thing you could do besides the factory, like Explorer lines or something, is like AN lines. I think that's not a bad option for yeah. most people. I think a lot of guys aren't going to be as anal about that kind of stuff as I am. Yeah. I like steel lines. I um, think it looks cleaner. I'm not a huge fan of long runs of flexible hose. Yeah, especially that, in your exhaust system. Yeah. Um, I like solid piping when I can have solid when you can piping. Haul, yeah. I mean, that's something you can, you can source that out of a salvage yard because, like I said, we did find an Explorer. Yeah. That was a 5-liter 4R70W. We got the hard lines. You got the hard lines out yeah. of it from pull, uh, pick, yeah. Yeah, pull, pull apart. apart. Yeah. Pull apart, yeah. So you got the hard lines out of that that we used on the wagon. That worked like yeah. a treat. And even you can just take some aluminum tubing that you can buy at an auto parts store and bend your own Would NICOP work for that on a 3H, do you think? Yeah. So you could probably do a NICOP yeah. line and bend them yourself. Yeah, any kind of fluid line will work. You don't okay. need anything fancy, no stainless steel, nothing like that. Now, the expensive side of things, you're going to probably, you're going to have to have a controller if you're doing a 4 r 70 w Yes, absolutely. And you're going to spend some money for that. Or you can do the redneck thing and wire it up to light switches. <laughs> <laughs> but what about, I mean, the controller actually does more than just... Yeah, way more, way more. I mean, it actually controls line pressures yeah. on things. You if, can soften your shifts, yeah. firm up your shifts. We like the uh, Quick Trick 4 mm -hmm. for what we do. There's also, I believe, the Quick Trick 2 still yeah. that is a, a, a dumbed down version of the 4. If you can afford it at all, I would recommend going out and doing the, the Quick Trick 4. Yeah, we still haven't set up the manual paddle shift stuff. <laughs> I'm like probably never going to Pro do that. Probably, probably should. Do it. It's a probably, wagon. We probably shouldn't do that in a way. <laughs> that would probably not. Yeah. <laughs> probably what not. What is it? Clarkson good. says something about not liking flappy paddle gearboxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's fine. He can, li he can not like it. <laughs> <laughs> he can afford to do whatever yeah. he wants at this point in his life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, that, I think from our point of view and the way we feel about it, the Quick Trick system is probably the best way to go. Yeah. As far as what you need. As far as a standalone controller. If you have like a Holly. You could probably get a Dominator, mm -hmm. um, and that'll control transmission. So there's, there's different does things. Does the sniper system do that as well? I do not believe so. I don't think it does um, either. Yeah, no. Not that we're worried about that, because when we if we get to do the sniper and the Falcon, we're going to be doing a five-speed anyway, yeah. so that's right out. So one of the things we ran into with the wagon mm -hmm. is that the Prindle setup on the shift controller from um, US Shift wants to see the neutral safety switch system for... Yeah, that goes on the side of the transmission. And the problem we ran into is with the wagon, it has the <laughs> neutral safety switch up on top of the column yeah. rather than down underneath the car. And there was just really yeah, almost no room in there for a neutral safety switch yeah. on the side of the transmission. Yeah. This body shouldn't be a problem with that. Um, but yeah, that is was a problem with Fairlane. So that's something we to keep in mind yeah. of when you're it, doing this, is if you're doing something with a chassis that allows it, I would recommend doing that so that you've got all the you don't have you don't have any code issues yeah. out of your uh, out of your box it'll work without it the wagon drives fine yeah the wagon mm -hmm. drives is fine neutral safety have, switch works yeah. like factory so it's just got a fault deal. code yeah it's got a fault code yeah. for that it's just something that would be kind of nice to have yeah. um on there just because it would clean up that code and i'm one of those kind of guys that i get real anal about oh, lights <laughs> not pretty lights, not pretty lights. <laughs> this is not Christmas. Um, another thing you're going to need is a drive shaft. Yep. Uh, we like aluminum. Yes. I like aluminum drive shaft on a classic car. It tends to knock out a lot of your driveline vibrations yep. that you can experience with them. Um, a little bit expensive, but... 
you're paying a little bit more money, but I mean, if you're doing a 4 r 70 w why would you selling out some money? Why would you scrimp on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, would do the. I got. I got to do the aluminum. Yeah. The problem we ran into is, is we thought about. So okay, what we'll do is is we'll do the drive shaft. Take a drive shaft out of a Crown Vic yep. and modify it because my reasoning was that it was the longest drive shaft in a late model Ford. Yep. And it was still <laughs> not long enough. <laughs> It's still not long enough for the wagon. Yep. It might would work on a Mustang, because I think the Mustang drive shaft is a little bit shorter than mm -hmm. the Fairlane. Absolutely, yeah. So it might would work in that case. Um, oh, uh, another thing, which is really not an outside expense, but something you need to keep in mind of on that thought process, is your driveline angles that you have from the factory. You, you want to try to maintain those. Okay with your cross member mounting and everything. So what I recommend you do is go in and take a measure from the bottom of the floor pan on the car to the very center of the main shaft out of the C4. And then you'll know what the original distance was from Ford, yep. what they were calling for on that. And if you've got that, then it can give you a good starting point for the 4R70W yep. to be in the right position. Because yep. that is one problem I've seen sometimes with <clears throat> what I see with aftermarket cross members out there is they tend to want to make it so it'll fit in the chassis. Yep. So they're not really giving a lot of consideration to drive line angle, mm -hmm. I think, sometimes with that stuff. So you want to have that information in hand before you start doing the work. Always check that first. Yep. After you get everything in there, you should get yourself an angle indicator like the one I'm showing you here so that you can mount that on the rear axle housing and on the yep. back of the transmission. Those Most of these come and, with... And your engine. And your uh, engine. Make sure your engine's got the correct downward tilt, and then you want to match up and equalize the angles to the transmission. And, and we can't angle. tell you what that is because it may be slightly different for all yeah. of them. I'm pretty sure Ford has a typical that they used on everything. The other thing you have to keep in mind of too is if you've lowered the front end on the car, that's going to change your driveline angle, yep. but not necessarily change your driveline angle. And what I mean by that is the car is tilting down, but the engine angle is still the same. Uh, it's where it should be in the chassis relative to the rear axle, theoretically. Because if you change the back end of the car and you drop the back end a lot, then your driveline angle may change again as yep. well. So all of that's going to be subjective. There's a lot of things you can see online out there on how to do driveline angle. We actually did a video on it a little while back that kind of covers some of that stuff. Um, so you can take a look at that as well. What, what was it you were saying? What the, the real basis of it is what? You want equal and opposites on the transmission output shaft to the uh, rear axle yoke. So you typically want the transmission pointing down. Think the decent spec for roundabout is three to six degrees of downward. Uh, and then you want the rear axle upwards the same amount exactly. Now, why do you do that? Um, because what actually happens if the drive, if you have one of them that's down low, the if you were to graph out the drive shaft acceleration, uh, you would start to see a sine wave. Anytime the cross of one of the U joints goes through its bind section, the drive shaft will actually accelerate and twist. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so you'll get you'll start going down the road and you might hit a bump and you'll just feel the car start an unholy shake. But then also you'll feel it like push back, push pull, push pull. Right, yeah. because the drive shaft's yeah. actually doing this. Yeah, and it, well, it's torquing and it's accelerating the rear axle and slowing the rear axle down to meet the bindingness, so to right, speak. Right, right. So if you match the angles, it cuts out that oscillation. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's you know, you don't want to put a 4R70W and spend all that money on it and have it yeah. try <laughs> to shake apart while you're going down the interstate. Yeah, and that'll destroy way more than you would imagine. Oh, yeah. Um, that'll destroy the transmission all the way up to the front of it. Uh, if you let it go, it'll break the case of the transmission. It'll mm -hmm. break the rear axle. It'll blow the yoke bearing right out of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. It can Just cause little it. things like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing you mentioned, which I don't necessarily agree with, is running the 8.8 .8 from, let's say, the Explorer, mm -hmm. which is a real popular thing for folks to yeah. do. So on, on this car we're talking because the eight inch in it has a 270 something rear, act, rear right. gear. A little bit low for a uh, 4R70W, you want like a 300 plus. Yep. 
Um, that's what I like. Yeah, three hundred. You could do the two seventy nine, and yeah. your gas mileage would actually probably not be as good in the city. Once you get be highway, better on, yeah, it'll cruise on the highway. Oh yeah, you'll you'll be doing fifteen hundred every speeding RPM. ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be doing ninety or hundred because you're thinking you're in a sixty seven Mustang, yeah. and it's running along at a thousand RPM at 85, 90 miles an hour. Yeah, with that two seventy nine out back. So, you would need to re re gear it. You could either replace the hog's head or the third member, whatever you want to call it, to rear, rear gear it, or you could put new ring and pinion in it, more time. Or if you're at the junkyard, like we were saying before, and you found a 4R75 Oak vehicle with an 8.8, you could just pull the rear axle out of it. And you get rear disc brakes at that point. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but... Go ahead, you hit that butt button. You got more work ahead of you <laughs> because the axles on the 8.8s are offset. Yes. We so. we also did a video on that. There's a video out that we have that talks about the 8.8 and why I'm not crazy about it as a swap, only from the aspect of all the things you have to do in actually yeah. in order to make that work out. So take a look at that video. I'll put the link to it down here below us. Um, but I am not a big proponent of the 8.8. I understand what he's saying about mm -hmm. that. I don't just ne don't necessarily agree with the thought process. I think you would be better served if the car already has an eight inch in it to go ahead and put a different ring and pinion in there. Yeah. You just do the 325. You can get one from Quick Performance. They have the, you can buy a complete hogshead from them or center section if you want to call it that to, uh, to replace everything with a 325. Even if you want to go with an Eaton Detroit True Track, Traction Lock, whatever you want to put in there, they have the axle set up for that and you still are running your stock axle and you're not having to cut axles off and blah, blah, blah. And there's tons of companies out there now making disc brake kits for the back of these things. Yeah. And I'm actually not a big proponent of rear disc brakes in a lot of respects too, but we'll go into that in a different video at some point. Yeah. If you guys wanna know why I feel that way, leave a comment in the section below and we'll talk about it in another video down the road where we do another one of these kind of videos. Um, also fluid. Need a oh case. yes. Need a case, an entire case of fluid. And you'll want to change that fluid out. A couple hundred miles in. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, just most transmissions that you get from aftermarket companies, they have, uh, they've been dynoed. Mm -hmm. So they're already. Yeah, the monster we got yeah, in was dynoed. They're, they're broken in. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will have the first few hundred miles, a little bit of clutch wear, just from all of them engaging, disengaging, and burning in. Uh, so I'd probably run 500,000 miles on the Maybe first Maybe we should say wear. I don't like the word burn. <laughs> 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 but yeah, and, and you want to use a nice, I mean, obviously you got to run Mercon 5 yep. with the, uh, or some guys call it Mercon V. Yep. Um, we got to run Mercon 5, which is already a synthetic yep. um, in the 4R70W. That's what it requires. It's not an option. Yep. Um, run, and, run Mercon, run Motocrafter better. Yeah, because um, you and I were talking about that a little off camera, and we decided we didn't want to give any recommendations on particular types yeah. of Mercon to buy. But well, there's, there's Mercon, Mercon 6, the newest Mercon, whatever the Roman numeral is now. <laughs> They're all compatible with their previous iterations, except right. like Type F. Um, so all the yeah. Mercons are compatible with the newest one. So I still am one of those kind of guys, though, if that transmission called for Mercon 5, I am going to put Mercon 5 yeah. in it. All right, so transmission fluid. Mm -hmm. I guess that's really it for needful things for a 4R70W. What I'm gonna to try to do is I should have below me here the cost of all of that. I'm gonna give you round robin cost on transmission and there'll be a list here and there'll also be in the description below of what it costs to do this modification. And we're gonna go ahead and base it off of a 67 Mustang. Uh, buying a drive shaft from a company that sells drive shafts rather than having the drive shaft done locally because that's gonna be variable to your area. Yeah. Uh, so things like uh, we'll just we'll just have a list. I'm not. I'm going to give you an average price for a 4R70W from an aftermarket builder, and then I'll give you a a, a a junkyard price if you went down to a pick and pull or a pull apart, and give you a round robin price on that. And then you'll have to figure out what it's going to cost you locally to get it rebuilt because that is going to be a different kind of thing. I mean, it's going to be different everywhere in the United States on your local area. So we'll do that. That'll be below me here. The full number's here. The breakdown number's below that. And it's all going to be ish. These are just general <laughs> thought idea numbers. These aren't exactly, you, you shouldn't call somebody and say, I saw a video on YouTube and this man says you're going to sell this to me for this price. From 10 years ago. Because <laughs> you may be watching this <laughs> in five years. And, you know. The prices change tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, the prices change tomorrow because, you know, it is 
inflation bill right now. <laughs> so, all right, well, I guess that's really it. I wanted to do this before we started working on the thing because it also kind of puts me in mind of the things we need to make sure we got and then we order. <laughs> the extensive for the, list. The extensive list. That's the weird thing about this mm -hmm. in closing, I guess, is that you don't think that there's a ton involved until you start yeah. getting involved. Until you start looking at the details. And so now what we've done is to some of you men and ladies out there, we have probably gone in and frightened you out of doing a 4R70W. <laughs> Just stay with your C4. Do like this car's got a 279 out back with a C4. Honestly, it runs fine. for 90% of where you're going to go in the world, that's going to be fine. But this guy's going to be driving this thing in the Atlanta area and going down to Savannah, coming over this way because he's got family in South Carolina, and he wants to drive this car. So he's going to be on the interstate a lot, and the 4R70W for is, is a yeah. good 90% for him. Yeah, for a highway vehicle that you want it. Yeah. C4 will do the job, do it wonderfully. But, but you're going to be throwing a lot of RPM at yep. it. Even, even with the 279, yeah. you're probably still going to be in the 2200 RPM range, depending mm -hmm. on the wheels and tires you got on it. Yeah, mine, I have a 300 rear gear, and I was 2000 RPM at 70 mile an hour. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. I mean, that's, that's roughly about where you're going to be at. Two or 3,000, I can't remember. Yeah, whatever it is. It's going to How's that again? Wah! It's about all you heard when you got out of the thing. <laughs> all right, folks. Well, that's our show for this week. Uh, come back and watch us next time. What I want you to do before you do that, though, is go out and check out the Patreon account. Uh, at the $10 a month level, you get monthly meetings with me on Zoom. It's a lot of fun. I don't have a, a ton of people that show up for it. I have all these people giving us money, and I'm on there once a month for free. <laughs> at my $10 level, you can see the list going up next to me. Well, I'll do it over here. Going up next to me over here or over here, depends on where Andrew puts it, every month, all these people are giving us money. And every month, like 18 people at the most will come into this meeting. So if you are on the list, come on in. It's great. I know a lot of people have things to do on Sunday nights, but you know, let's take a break from them. Come <laughs> in and take a look at what we do. It's a lot of fun. Also, if we've done anything at all to help you out, any amount of money that you want to put into it is great. It helps us feed the kids. It helps us feed Andrew and keep him here helping me do this, which allows me to do some of the other things that we need to do in order to keep this as a business running. Because for me, this is a business. It's also one heck of a lot of fun. Subscribe to the channel as well. We are on our march to 100,000 subscribers. We are danger close now. Uh, unless YouTube does something stupid and makes me pull my hair out by taking subscribers away from us, by the middle of February, we should have enough to give that to Deanna as her birthday gift. I already got her another gift, by the way, so I'm good to go. If we take that, <laughs> give it to her and take it back, she'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, yeah. She's got another gift, so it's, it's good. It's good. Um, switcheroo. Switcheroo. <laughs> Here, I'm giving you this, I'm taking it back, but I'm also giving you this. Uh, and really, I guess that's about it. So, be kind to each other, love on each other, treat each other nice. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time on Auto Resto Mod. You realize this is just a play for me to like not have to start pulling things up. <laughs> and the other thing we forgot to mention, the other thing I didn't mention, a transmission jack. Because the 4R70W oh, yeah. is actually heavier than the C4. Yeah. And it's a real pain to get out. So transmission jack, see if you stick around to the very end, you get to see all of this. <laughs> uh, transmission jack is something you also ought to have as well. Absolutely. Now we're going to need the one for a lift, but if you're doing it on the floor, you're going to need to do cribbing and up. Oh. If you're doing it on the floor, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not going to be any fun. I just don't even know any way to tell you. Because you have to lift everything up enough to be able to clear the transmission on the jack from underneath the car. Mm -hmm. So you are probably going to have to build a crib system like the one I'm showing you right now. Uh, these kind of crib systems are good for doing this kind of work. But then you're also going to have to wonder about the transmission jack being able to go up high. Enough. You guys have a great week. <laughs>